Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Inusor Education. Um, I would like to uh, move a little bit further um, talking about forces from um, relatively simple cases um, which we were considering before. Like, for instance, there is one force which is moving uh, an object um, in the uh, direction of the straight line and the force itself is also directed through the same, uh, to the same direction. So these are kind of simple um, cases. Well, rotation was slightly more difficult, but it's still uh, simpler than I would like to address right now. Now, uh, so this next um, category of complexity involves multiple forces. So we are talking about cases when an object is a subject of action of many different forces from many different directions in a three-dimensional world. Now, before talking about how these forces act and what's the result of this, uh, I would like to spend a few minutes basically talking about what kind of forces we are dealing with. And I have actually a list of forces which are, well, it's not complete exhausted listing, etc., but it, these are major forces we will be dealing uh, with in uh, studying physics. Now, the type of force, which we have already um, discussed many times, it's the force when uh, one particular object uh, acts upon another, and it's really like touching it. For instance, I'm pushing the cart, or car engine is moving the wheels, something like this. This is applied force, so the force which is really has a close relationship, close in geometric uh, sense relationship um, between the source of the force and the subject of the force. Okay, so these are applied forces and we talked about this many times um, and, and obviously there are many different kinds of this but more or less they're all related to a close contact between the source of the force and um, and, and, and the object which we are moving. Now next I would like to talk about is the force of friction. Well, we're all familiar with the force of friction. If you are moving an object um, on, on the surface, obviously surface has certain um, resistance, if you wish. Now the source of this resistance is well, the, the surface is not straight and the object is not really straight. Although we were talking about objects as point objects which have zero uh, uh, geometric size, um, we still should understand that this is just an abstraction and in reality, obviously, these um, in, uh, uh, une un uneven uh, surface and uneven um, object which is moving, they are uh, uh, touching each other and basically these uh, unevennesses uh, prevent the object to basically slide without any kind of um, uh, resistance from the surface where it's sliding. Well, in certain cases we have an approximation like whenever um, we are sliding on the ice um, there is a very, very little resistance and the person um, on the skating rink can actually go very, very far without basically moving. Um, he gains the speed and then moves just completely on inertia. Um, resistance is very small, but still resistance does exist even in this case and eventually he will stop, right? So the friction is caused by this type of unevenness between the surface and the object. Now, what's very important is um, to measure this particular force, how it can be measured. Well, we will definitely talk about this separately, um, but uh, in, in general, uh, I, I would like you to understand that the more pressure the object um, has towards the surface, 
which in horizontal, for instance, case means just the weight. Um, the more resistance, because these unevennesses are more deeply uh, are, are going into each other. So basically we can say that the friction is more or less proportional to um, how much weight in the horizontal case um, our object exhausts on the surface. Now in the non-horizontal cases there are different actual calculations and we will talk about this later on but just in general I wanted to have an impression um, what is the friction and what's the source of friction is these unevennesses, yeah, unevennesses between the surface uh, and the uh, and the object. Now, um, to the same category as the friction, we should actually put um, something which is called air resistance. Whenever the pl plane is flying in the air, the molecules of air actually are uh, well, scratching, if you wish, the surface of the uh, of the plane and prevent it to go uh, forward. Well, obviously the plane has a very strong engine and the air does not present such a big actual resistance, so under many circumstances we can just completely forget about the plane resistance. But if you are talking about higher speeds, then the plane um, actually does um, uh, experiences this type of a friction and the perfect example of this is when the spaceship coming down from the orbit into the earth well you know that it gets hot very very hot because the air resists and this friction between the air molecules and the uh, and the body of the of the spaceship is so great because of the speed is so great um, that it actually heats up the surface significantly. And the same thing actually when submarine, for instance, is under sea, um, same thing. Water resists, and in this case, water is much more dense than the air, so resistance is definitely significant. So whenever my submarine is going with a R relatively high speed, it really has to um, exhaust a lot of energy to overcome the resistance of the water. Next. Next is tension. Well, tension is also just yet another kind of uh, force and the, the perfect example is if this is a rope and this is the person who basically hold this rope and moves the uh, moves the object uh, forward. Now, the person does not touch the object; it's the rope. So the person pulls the rope. How this force, which the person exhausts on the rope, goes to um, the object? Well, this is basically what tension is all about. The rope has well, you can just imagine they have little links and uh, each link um, pulls another link, that other link moves the next one, etc. And that's how the whole force is transferred to the object. And meanwhile, rope is getting tighter. And that's what's the tension. So basically you can say that what actually pulls the object is the tension of the rope. And the source of the tension of the rope is the person who pulls it. So that's basically, the tension is always the transfer mechanism of the force from one place to another. Next is elasticity. Okay, elasticity, perfect example is a spring. So the spring can be stretched and when you are stretching the spring from its neutral position, it actually exhausts certain force on the object which is down there, which pulls it up. On the same um, uh, object there is, let's say, weight which goes down. So if object is uh, in a balance, uh, in a state of rest, it means that the weight is balanced by the elasticity 
uh, which is the property of the spring. Now similarly obviously you can have a rubber or something which is elastic. So elasticity is such a uh, quality, such a characteristic of a material that if it's deformed then it, it, it has a tendency to go back and if you prevent it to go back then it actually exhausts the force which is trying to uh, put it back. And uh, the source of this again is molecular. That's how this particular material is uh, built inside. Uh, it, if, it's a, if it's a spring, then the material, let's say a steel, which is usually used for the spring, is such a material which can be deformed, well, up to an extent, of course, uh, not to break it, but it can be deformed slightly, and then the molecules are kind of stretching, or whatever you can call it, and then it attempts actually to, to go back unless you stretch it really so strongly that you break it. But that's a different story. They're talking about normal stretching mechanism which doesn't break it. And obviously the, um, the qu quantitative characteristic of the spring is how much effort it actually uh, can, um, can, can make to pull this thing back into the uh, original state of neutral position. Well, it's usually related to how much you stretch it. So the amount of stretch is uh, probably proportional, and we will basically talk about this. There is a Hooke's law about this. So the stretching, uh, the more you the more you stretch this spring, the more force it exhausts on on the uh, it, it exhorts on the object which is attached to it. Okay. So elasticity force next. Next is gravity. Well, we all know what gravity actually is. All masses are attracted to each other. And it's always attraction. Now, um, we are usually talking about gravity in uh, reference to Earth. So everything has certain weight, which is basically a measure of how strongly Earth uh, pulls down the object on it. But don't forget that this particular object pulls with exactly the same force the Earth. Different story is that the Earth is big and the object is usually small, so the Earth maybe doesn't feel very much how this particular object pulls it. Besides, there are many, many objects on the planet and each one of them pulls in its own uh, direction and all of them might actually be uh, nullifying each other but the Earth pulls everything towards its center and the surface of the Earth, since it's um, uh, solid, uh, it prevents us from basically falling down uh, because there is another force, the reaction of the surface where we are standing on, like on the floor or on the ground, the reaction is going opposite to, um, to the force of gravity. Now, um, but again, gravity is between any two masses. Uh, and a perfect example, by the way, of this is the discovery of the planet uh, Pluto. I think it was Pluto discovered this way, or Neptune, I don't remember. One of the planets, actually. Um, it was discovered by knowing that another planet um, is uh, not having exactly the same um, trajectory around the Sun as it's supposed to by itself, which means there is another body which pulls it somewhere else and that body was basically discovered by calculations and then the astronomers pointed the telescope into that place where the calculations predicted should be uh, another planet which distorts the, the orbit of, I think, the orbit of Neptune and, um, and that's how the Pluto was discovered. So the gravity. Next, electricity. Well, electricity is in some respect like magnetism, uh, sorry, like, uh, like gravity, um, which means it just two electric charges are attracted to each other, but there is a condition. They are attracted only if they are charged with opposite um, with opposite charge. One as we call it positive, another as we call it negative. 
let's not um, dwell into what is the reason for positive or negative. Anyway, there are two kinds of charges. Now, in case of gravitation, all masses are the same. They are all um, attract to each other. Now, we are not talking about antimatter. That's a different story. Um, but whatever we are uh, actually dealing with is always a normal mass, and all, all normal masses are attracting to each other. Dealing with electricity, we have two different kinds of electric charge, which we call positive and negative. So positive and negative are attracting to each other, and this is exactly like in the gravitational case. In case of gravity, attraction is proportional to each mass. In case of electricity, attraction is proportional to the electric charge. Now, if, however, you have similar um, uh, charges, like positive to positive or negative to negative, well, instead of attracting, they are repelling to each other. And the force of repelling is also exactly the same quantitatively as if they were of different charge of the same magnitude and attracting to each other. So that's my electricity. And finally, I would like to talk about another um, thing called magnetism. Now, magnetism is just yet another physical quality. And um, in case of, again, it's similar and it's different. It's similar to electricity in such a way that uh, things which are magnetized can be attracting to each other or can be repelling. However, <coughs> in case of electricity, we can have one object which is charged positively and another which is charged negatively or positively, and then we can attract or repel each other. In case of magnetism, any one object has always two things inside it, two poles. One pole is called conditional, it's called north, and another is called south. So these are two poles within the same object, always. You cannot have one object which is only north and another is only uh, south. No, each object has north and south. And if they are attached in such a way that north and south, they are attracting, but north and north or south and south are repelling to each other. And again, it's relatively the same way. It's proportional to the magnitude. The force is proportional to the magnitude uh, of the magnetic uh, um, of magnetism, which this particular uh, object has. So, this is a very short introduction into different kinds of forces, which we will study separately, each one separately. So now, when we know that there is such a multitude of forces, let's talk about how the object behaves if multiple forces are applied to it. And in this particular case, I would like to say that it doesn't really matter what's the kind of, so, uh, of the forces which are applied to this particular object. Whether it's an uh, applied force or is it, is it a friction or whatever, forces are forces. And each force is a vector, which means it has a direction and a magnitude. And if these are the vectors and they're all applied to the same object, which again, let me remind you, we are considering a point object which has zero size, which means all of these forces are applied against the same point where certain mass basically is located. So the principle of superposition, which we are talking about today, superposition, this is a very important principle. It states that all these forces combined together, which are acting at the same time on the same point object, can be replaced by one force, which is a vector sum of all the vectors of all these forces. So we are adding them as vectors. And this particular one force, which is a sum, vector sum, of all the forces which are um, uh, acting on, uh, on the object produce exactly the same effect on the object. So object will move in exactly the same fashion if only that one resulting force is applied as all of these forces separately are acting on the object. This is called the principle of superposition. Well, um, 
Now a couple of examples. If you have a rocket, for instance, which is vertically starting from the ground, you have two forces. One is its own weight, and another is the force which basic, basically the engine um, develops, which pushes the 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 uh, the rocket up. So these are two forces. One of them is up. Another is down. And if I will do this. which in this particular case, since the forces are acting along the same vertical line, this one is down, this one is up, then my result will also be this vertical line, and the magnitude will be the difference of the magnitude between F F1 and F2, right? So that's a simple case. So this particular um, uh, vector sum is almost like um, al algebraic sum, one is a positive, another is negative. And obviously we hope that the magnitude of F1 is greater than the magnitude of F2, otherwise the rocket would not fly. Okay, next. Simple example of car which actually moving uphill. This is the car. What kind of forces are acting on this particular car. Okay, well, first of all, obviously, there is a force of its own engine which pulls it uphill. On another hand, there is a weight which goes down, right? Are there any other forces? Well, let's just think about it. If there are no other forces, the car would just go, what's the algebraic What's the vector sum of this? The car would go down, <laughs> which doesn't really happen, which means there is another force, actually, right? So what is another force? The reaction of the road which uh, it, it goes uh, along. And the reaction is always perpendicular to the surface of the road, which means there is another vector, which is vector of reaction. This is the force, and this is the weight. Now, sum of these three better be in this direction and that's exactly where we are going and it is i mean the calculations will show whenever we will do this um, uh, uh, problem in, in, in real uh, we will see that the calculations are actually uh, showing that the resulting force will be obviously along along the um uh, the uh, along the road uphill now, why? Well, because this reaction force and this weight are very much related to this angle. So if you will do the calculations, everything will be fine. Car will not go uh, under, under the ground. It will go along the road uphill. And um, the third example which I wanted to present is, let's say you have a pendulum. So it goes left and right. Now what kind of forces act on this guy? Now let's assume that it's a vertical plane where this uh, pendulum is uh, moving. So obviously there is a weight here, but it doesn't move down, right? It moves along the arc. Why? Well, obviously there is another force. This is a tension force. Tension force doesn't let it go down, it acts on the same object and it pulls it this way and the vector sum of these would be a tangential line to this arc, obviously, and that's what moves it. And it's always tangential because in this particular position it would be this. So whatever we have, whatever the position we have, the, um, uh, the object will move uh, um, around uh, around this point on on a, on a circle um, within this arc left and right, so we always have to uh, consider all the different forces which are acting, and uh, if 
if you miss something, you will have the wrong result, obviously. So, in this particular case, don't forget, there is a tension here, and there is a weight. You cannot do any kind of calculations if you don't take into consideration the tension of the, thre of the thread, right? Same thing with the previous problem, the car. If you don't take into consideration the reaction of the road, you will not have the correct uh, equation of motion and uh, your car will go under. <laughs> Alright, so basically that's it. What I suggest you, as usually, is to read notes for this particular lecture on unizor.com. <coughs> And um, uh, the site, unizor.com, is, uh, well, first of all, it's a free site. Um, there is a whole course of uh, advanced mathematics, math for teens. This is the physics for teens, so there is a prerequisite, which is a math for teens. And uh, also, there is even something else, there is a civics course, U.S. law for teens, if you're interested. <coughs> and again, the site is free, no advertisement, so please use it. Well, that's it. Thank you very much, and uh, good luck.